get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. So I was chatting with a friend, colleague, Dan Fagella, and asking him what other great guests I should have on, and he wrote to me, Amit has some pretty insane experiences in scaling a company, $11 million dollars, Uh, business in something like two to three years and he's been nice to me and helped me grow my business over the last several months. Uh, Today we have Amit Mehta. He's founder of Boost Software that he grew from zero to $11.6 million within three years. He wrote the book from zero to $12 million to bust. I, I hardly, like when I was reading that chapter, I was like, wait, is this bust thing right? And the sub headline, which I love is Inc. 5000 CEO reveals how to avoid these nine hidden traps that can destroy your business. At the end, he'll tell you where you can, you can either buy it or he's actually generous enough to, to give it away for people to read it because it's so valuable. You know, and before the call, he just casually mentions, oh yeah, I had this $6 million blogging business, by the way. And Um, He also co-founded 10xgrowthhacker.com where he runs growth hacking workshops showing startups how they scale growth through unorthodox marketing strategies. Amit, thanks for joining me. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. You know, when I ask about fun facts, you have a lot of quirky and fun facts. I love them. Now, you (laughs) eat paleo, you listen to crazy meditation CDs, that's your words, not mine, and you do biohacking and you take 30 pills a day. So tell me about these 30 pills a day. What do you do? What are you taking? Yeah, so I'm optimizing uh, all types. Like, there's two big supplements I believe are like most Americans efficient in. It's iodine and magnesium. So mm-hmm. I heavily dose on those. Mm-hmm. Um, iodine used to be in bread, like in the and in the 70s they switched to bromide. Bromide is actually really bad for your body, so it collects in your body. Mm. So uh, and the iodine you get from salt is just not enough. Right. So I take like. I take something called liquid kelp. So I take a couple drops of iodine, right, three, right. Drops, three or four, four drops of iodine every day. And the reason I started doing this is I did something called an iodine loading test. This is kind of like a biohack that most people don't know about. You did it it's, or did you go to like a physician or? I did it. It was a crazy story. So it's like this pill you can get and it's like 50 milligrams of iodine, which is like 10 times more than you want to take in a day. Okay. And you take this and you drink a lot of water, uh, and you kind of peed out into a container, <laughs> you send it to a lab, <laughs> and they kind of measure like how much iodine you pissed out. Right. And if you didn't piss out that much, that means your body absorbed a lot, and that mm. means you're deficient. Right. So I, I didn't piss out that much. I was deficient. Not only that, when I took the pill, um, it was crazy. I turned pale white, and I was like really sick. I had a massive detox response. It wow. turned out from the testing, I had high levels of bromide and fluoride in my body. Wow. So uh, it's crazy. So I started taking the iodine slowly. I started ramping up over a course of a, a, a six weeks, and I just felt better and better and better. My mind lit up, mm. and it was just that was just one of the bio acts I did to That's improve amazing. my health. And yes. so there's all types of stuff like that out there. That's just one example. So and what else do you take? So 30 of these pills. I mean, not to list all of them, but so you take the the – Iodine, you take the the magnesium. What else do you find? Magnesium is really great. Uh, a lot of people are deficient in it, believe it or not, and it makes you really calm. It's really great for your health. Yeah. Uh, I take uh, vit- vitamin B12. Yeah. Uh, actually, in general, I take a ton of different B vitamins. I take a special form called methylated B vitamins, which are easier to absorb. Yeah. I have my and- sublingual B vitamins right here too. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it, it's it's great for improving energy levels, brain function, and like even if you're not a vegetarian, you still need to take B vitamins yeah. because just most people just don't get enough. Yeah. And uh, I take vitamin C, which is no brainer. I take um, cod liver oil. I take I, I I consume raw fermented cod liver oil. So it's like in the oil oil form. Yeah. So yeah, how it's... bad does it taste? Because I take <laughs> one that's like lemon flavored. 
Yeah, yeah, I have one that's like cinnamon flavored, okay. so it kind of like tones down. Not the... horrible. So, so actually, it's, it's actually pretty good. It tastes. I think it has some like xylitol or stevia in there or whatever. So it kind of tones down the that's really horrible. harsh fish flavor. Yeah. And uh, and I noticed like a funky story about that. My wife and I stopped taking it for like a couple months for yeah. a reason. Just got busy with stuff. Yeah. And we started getting sick like crazy. Wow. What the hell's going on? We never get sick. And we're like, wait, we stopped taking the cutler roll. We started taking again, boom. Wow. I haven't got sick since. So it's really great for the immune system. Yeah. And just, you know, kind of fending off viruses and bacteria or whatever yeah. may hit you, especially living in Boston, such an issue. You know, I think this is an important conversation because in business, it's just really important to maintain your health and your sanity. And, you know, if people, I highly suggest people read your book. Um, you know, I'll just tell people you can go to profitswami.com and it's there or you can go to Amazon because it's so powerful. I mean, the stories you tell, which we'll, we'll get into are just, I cannot believe some of this stuff happened. And like I was saying before we started, I don't know how you've had a heart attack by now based off of all that. Um, so that kind of goes into, you said you have some rituals for your head. Yeah. So another thing I do, so I wake up in the morning. I, first thing I do is I make something called bulletproof coffee. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it, but yeah, it's, sure. Uh, Dave it's Aspie's butter bulletproof coffee. Yeah. Yeah. So Dave Aspie is an old friend of mine. So nice. I knew about this like years ago before it was popular. And so I take, I, I, ha, I have, uh, I have like a ceramic French press. I grind my own beans, put it in there. Um, I add in a, uh, some ghee, cocoa powder, vanilla, and MCT oil. Yeah. Mix that up, and it uh, it's probably one of the most powerful things I do all day. It just gets my brain. It's it's probably the best uh, mental biohack I've done in terms of just like I, th I think it, like instantly gives me like a ten point IQ jump for at least a couple hours. Yeah. So does it last? You find how, how long? It lasts pretty long. Yeah. Like um like th like on the low side three hours. On the on the high side almost a whole uh, almost to like five p.m. Wow depending on the day. And I think the fat in there helps like slow the absorption of all all the stuff. So yeah. you kind of get a steady flow of energy throughout the day instead yeah. of like, just drinking straight black coffee and then you just get a spike yeah. for like a very short period of time and a crash. Yeah, so what else What else do you do rituals for your head? And so I do that and then I use, a, I use an app called a Time Out. Okay. It's an app that's really obnoxious and for a purpose it like basically runs in the background when you're working and like every 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how you program it, it freezes your computer up and forces you to take like uh, a break, at oh, least wow. 10 minutes. That is annoying. 10 minute break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in, in, in terms of, this is the whole idea of, um, if you ever read like Tony Schwartz, um, Powerful Engagement, he talks about taking periodic breaks of the day to improve, like doing chunks of activity yeah. and, and focus like stretches, like intervals, like yeah. 60 to 90 minute intervals, taking a break, I'll take a break, I'll, I'll put on, I'll, I listen to this uh, meditation, This bi it's called binaural beats. Yeah, I've heard of it, yeah. And so there's a lot of people heard of binaural beats, but I've done a lot of research in binaural beats, I've been doing it for like six, seven, eight years, and so I found a company that has probably the most uh, cutting edge technology when it comes mm. to binaural beats, it's called iWake Technologies. iWake Technologies. And it's okay. a smaller company, most people never heard of, but uh, they do a lot of, um, they're like tinkers. So the guy who founded the company, he's a tinker and he just likes to sit down and experiment. Yeah. He's kind of like a, a growth hacker for... Like a mad scientist. Like a mad scientist. And he's just like, he found like some crazy uh, ways of improving the technology above and beyond anything that's out there in the market. And so I listened to that uh, for about one hour a day. I usually do like my 90 minute stretch, do 20 minutes of that. And then do 20 minutes later in the day and then 20 minutes in the evening. Yeah. And then I'll also, like, uh, I'll do these breaks every 90 minutes and I'll go to, I have a gym downstairs in my house. So I'll do, like, either kettlebell swings or uh, I'll lift some weights, yeah. either squats, lunges, uh, or upper body yeah. uh, about once a day. Or uh, about twice a week, I'll go to yoga. So, I mean, for I people who don't for know binaural beats, why do you do it? What does it do? It actually it makes meditation about a hundred times more effective mm -hmm. versus just sitting there with your eyes closed because it puts your mind automatically in a meditative state. Mm -hmm. So it, it basically takes whatever meditation practice you're doing and amplifies the effectiveness like ten to hundred x. 
Don't quote me on that. I'm just, that's yeah. just how subjective I mean, I feel. What we haven't mentioned at this point is you actually have a PhD in physics, which we're going to talk about too, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And um, I want to go back. I mean, so where'd you grow up? What was it like? I grew up in uh, New Jersey, yeah. in central New Jersey. And uh, I had a lot of health challenges growing up. Really? And I, I wasn't very, uh, I was kind of the, the kid who was always picked on in school. You know, I was always a kid, you know, they had pizza every week in, um, in grade school. And I always got the pizza that with the, there was always one slice with all the, the cheese ripped off. And so that's when I always got. What, was, what kind of health challenges? Kid, and I realized all my health issues, looking back yeah. at my age right now, a lot of my health issues were connected with uh, eating gluten and other uh, foods that just weren't working for my body. What kind of health challenges were you talking? Like I had a lot of, I was almost like pre-asthmatic. I was really? very skinny and emaciated. Um, really? I had trouble concentrating and focusing. I had a brain fog. Like uh, I couldn't read till I was, you know, like eight years old. Yeah, I read that. Like seeing, okay, this guy's got a really impressive background, PhD in physics, and all successful businesses. Um, and then I was reading your book. I think it's in your book, and you said like I was in, you failed reading or something really. really yeah, hard. yeah. Yeah, it took me a lot of just like brute force to teach myself how to read. <laughs> so what was a big influence for you growing up? Um, probably just like just a lot of books I read, you know. Like I read like Isaac Asimov. I love science fiction. I read Isaac Asimov, uh, Ray Bradbury. So I, I fell in love with that. And that's how I taught myself how to read. It's just I read stuff I enjoyed. Wow. And it, I, I read really, really slow. But... After doing it enough times, I just <laughs> improved. Yeah. What made you get into physics? I mean, I remember taking physics. I'm like, this is the hardest class I've ever taken. I, I feel sorry for anyone who majors in <laughs> physics. <laughs> well, I think it was kind of a science fiction angle. Like, I read a lot of science fiction growing up. Right. And so I fell in love with that. And then I kind of had a knack for math. And then when I took physics, I just fell in love with it. I loved it. I thought it was an amazing... I just had, I had a natural kind of... Like, I think everyone has natural strengths and abilities, and, yeah. and really the secret in life is to find those. Mm -hmm. You know, because the key to being successful in life, I, it's if you think of like three circles, like one is you know your passions, the other is um, let me see your strengths, yeah. and the other is business model. Right. So if you can find the intersection of your passions and strengths, and and have a business model that goes yeah. with that, then that's really the key to to really achieving like yeah. you know massive success in life. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. So what, what did you want to do when you were in college or getting your PhD? What did you envision yourself doing? I, f I wanted to become like a physics, like Richard Feynman. I wanted to be like a physics geek, a physics professor and, and go down that route. But I, I kind of, you know, my part of India, where I come from, uh, it's, they're, they're all, it's a line of business owners. A lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners. It kind of runs in my blood, and I think those genes kind of kicked in in yeah. my twenties. And I'm like, I don't want to do physics anymore. I kind of got burned out, and uh, I, I just I think my uh, my uh, genes from my uh, my family kicked in, and I'm like, I want to do business. Yeah. What did your parents do? My dad uh, was an engineer, mechan uh, a chemical engineer, and my mom was a bookkeeper. Yeah. So. What'd you do? So you get your PhD in physics. That's a huge, a really long road. Actually, at U of I, Champaign. Uh, yeah, a man, lot yeah. of friends go there. I'm, I'm in Chicago, so a lot of friends go to U of I. Cool. Uh, amazing school, one of the top in the country for, for engineering. Um, then what'd you do after you, you left there and graduated? I worked at uh, MIT Lincoln Labs in Lexington. Okay. It was like big, you know, big government institution. Didn't enjoy it at all. Very cold environment, you know? Yeah. And so I, I just, and it was kind of an environment where I saw my boss like, you know, there's like these jobs where your boss breathes down your neck. This was the opposite. I didn't see my boss for months on end. And so he'd like, give me a project. And then, you know, I'd work on it. And, be like, and then I'd meet with them after three months. And he'd go, oh, that's nice. And then he put it aside. I'm like, okay, here's what we're working on next. Like, it didn't matter at all. <laughs> So, so I, I hated working there, and that's kind of what motivated me to, yeah. you know, kind of be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Or 
at least make enough money as an entrepreneur so I can quit my job. Yeah, so were you doing something as you were working at the MIT labs or? Yeah, so on my evenings and weekends and partially while I was working <laughs> because I hated working there. I, uh, I, I taught myself how to do affiliate marketing, which is basically promoting other other companies' products and services through various channels, particularly Google AdWords. Right. And this was in 2005 when Google AdWords was, uh, it was a wild west days at Google AdWords. Right. You might traffic as you wanted for five cents a click. Right. How'd you even discover that though? I mean, like you're in a lab, you're PhD <laughs> physics. I mean, how, how do you stumble across affiliate marketing? Um, it took me a while. I, I was kind of scouring the internet yeah. and um, for like had a, I, I knew that people were making money on the internet and yeah. that's about all I knew about the internet is that this cool thing where you could you know start a business. So I'm like, hey, how do I start a business? So I, I stumbled on Spirit Marketing. I'm like, wow, this is the um, I think I was right. Have you ever read like Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad? Sure. Dad? Yeah. I read that book. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And that's kind of what inspired me to, you know, go on, become an entrepreneur and, mm. you know, not follow the job route and get an affiliate program. I'm like, cool, I can, mm. you know, kind of make a, make a website, put banners on it and start making up to $500 a month. That was my goal when I started. Right. And so I started a website called developresidualincome.com. Okay. I said, okay, I'm going to write articles and get SEO and, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make 500 bucks a month, which was huge back when I was a graduate student because I was making $1,200 a month as a grad student. So $500 a month. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. yeah. It's massive. You know, I was living in, my wife and I were living in like 270 square foot apartment. And uh, we could, uh, we could barely pay our, uh, our, our, my parents were, help, uh, our parents were helping our, uh, pay our grocery bills because we just got married. She wasn't working and right. it was just on my, living on my $1,200 a month income. Yeah. It was pretty tight. Starting out, that's how it is. Yeah. So when that's did you start to see traction with the affiliate so market? It, it, it's a crazy story. So I started a site called developresidualincome.com, even though I had none. Right. And after six months of busting my butt uh, with SEO, guess how much traffic I had? Two unique visitors a week <laughs> and not a single affiliate sale. I was like, what the hell's going on here? And so... Um, those two unique and, visitors was you and your wife, or no? <laughs> and then, and then at the time, I went through this like I was doing like a lot of personal growth, like reading a lot of personal growth books, and so I went through this like CD series where this guy talks about you know, like um, it was something crazy. I don't even remember the guy's name, but he said you know, set an impo the the key to success is setting an impossible goal. Like set a goal that's actually impossible, and then you know, go for it. And so I said, okay, um, I'm not making any money right now, zero. My goal is to make $500 a month. I mean, made a single cent in commissions and said, okay, it wasn't a possible goal. I was making probably, like this is uh, back when I had started at MIT Lincoln Labs. I was making like $7,500 a month before payroll taxes and stuff. I said, the possible goal is if I make $10,000 a month as an affiliate. Right. Because I'm making nothing there right now. Right. Craziest thing, because literally within four months of setting that goal, I hit $10,000 a month. Wow. I, I, I kind of realized when I set that goal, wait, what I'm doing right now is not working. I need to change my strategy. Right. I need to pivot. I learned, I, I learned the concept of a pivot before I even knew what it was. And then I, I did a little more research. And I thought, hey, I can actually promote affiliate products through pay-per-click marketing. Hmm. And that's a much more effective strategy. And this is back in the, in the Wild West days of Google where you can buy as much traffic as not for five cents. So within ten, within four weeks, uh, four months, I was able to replace a $90,000 a year job mm. income. And within six months after that, I was making $20,000 a month. Wow. Funny thing happened there. I had my first um, major challenge and setback as What's an entrepreneur. That? I handed, I went to work, I handed my resignation. I said, hey, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm walking away in three weeks. I was, you know, I, I, I was like uh, puffed, I was like puffed up like a rooster. So proud <laughs> and excited, you know? Like, it was like the most amazing thing in my life, you know? Most amazing experience. And then a week later, my affiliate income went to zero. Why? <laughs> Apparently, uh, the merchant had to change, uh, I was promoting products in ClickBank. He had to change some 
the way his site was working, his flow as a program, yet uh, apparently he wasn't totally compliance with ClickBank. He had to make some changes to make his site 100% compliant with ClickBank rules. Conversions went to zero. Wow. Like, I was literally, like, income That's went to That's scary. And so uh, my cousin came up to me and said, hey, you know, me, you need to go back to your job. This is, you had your fun, you did your thing, you made a little bit of money, great, you need to go back to your job. I had a decision to make. Was I going to burn my bridges and take a leap of faith, or was I going to cower under my bed yeah. with my tail tucked in like, uh, like a scared puppy and give up? Yeah. As you can imagine, you know what I did? I right. said, I'm burning my bridges, I'm going to make this work no matter what. Yeah. I had a gun to my head within 30 days. I got back to, I think, making $8,000 a month. Wow. And, uh, and then six months after that, I was making $2,000 a day profit. Wow. All because I made that one decision to step out and say, hey, I'm going to make it work no matter what happened. And that's kind of the entrepreneur spirit, the, you know, taking a step out into the unknown and just having enough faith. Yeah. The you last know. thing, like the worst nightmare is exactly what happened, which is you quit and then you go... Yeah. Zero. Yeah. So how long do you do the affiliate marketing? So that was that was 2006 when I quit my job. I'll never forget it. It was um, the greatest day of my life. Uh, June 15, 2012. Uh, sorry, June 15, 2006. The last day I worked a job in my entire life. Yeah. That and so amazing. that was a very special moment. Just to get, It's a big barrier, you know? Yeah. Walk in. And so I did that for 2007, 2008, 2009. I did affiliate marketing. And then in 2009, at the same time, I, I built up a blog between 2007 and 2008 called Super Affiliate Mindset, where I openly shared all my strategies about affiliate marketing. Um, just, yeah, I mean, you I said wrote, this You said this in passing, like just in passing, you know, yeah. when we're talking before the call. So go in a little bit deeper with this, because that's pretty, pretty phenomenal results. Yeah. So I super affiliate mindset. So I, I started blogging. I uh, I told people in the industry that I knew. People started linking to my blogs. My blog started growing. Um, I got a couple links from influencers, which skyrocketed my blog uh, to the stratosphere, literally. And I, I within six within like six to twelve months, I got to three thousand three thousand RSS readers. So this is back in the day when RSS was still popular. Right. Back in like two thousand eight. And so I had 3,000 RSS readers uh, from all over the world. And I built a massive brand. And I, I started speaking at uh, Affiliate Summit, which is our major conference. I, started, I spoke there like six, seven times. And uh, from there, I, I literally, what would have been the best strategy at this point was probably start cold emailing like influ influencers and stuff. I didn't even know how to do that. I actually, had, I actually built such a big brand that people were contacting me I had a guy named Onyx Singal contact me and said, hey, do you want to turn everything you talked about in your course into an information product? Um, and then we can create a membership program of this. And this is what my company specializes in. You know, the company called Affiliate Classroom. And I said, okay, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot and see what happens. Well, 18 months later, uh, we, we built a $6 million business together. Wow. <laughs> doing that. It's amazing. And just by literally, I created the course and... We reached out to other, other you know, big players and influencers in the industry and said, "Hey, you know, promote our course. We're having this huge product launch, and we got a lot of traction from that." So, what did the course teach? The course taught uh, affiliate marketing strategies, just mm. basically what I found on the blog using pay per click paid advertising. So, I went into great detail about how to you know how to do our Google AdWords, how to pick an affiliate offer, how to find uh, how to get traction and uh, create like basically a full-time income, potentially a full-time income from that, or even some people just created a part-time income and they're happy with that. Right. So how long were you doing the, then the affiliate marketing program or training program? I did that. That was just like a, a 18 month stint. And then my business partner and I went our own ways. And that's when I decided to start uh, Bruce software and said, Hey, I, I, the affiliate marketing space was getting increasingly difficult. Google was cracking down on affiliates like crazy. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't make sense promoting um, 
doing PPT Classroom any, any, any longer. Yeah. It kind of, that time was... That's when Google started slapping every, anyone who's an affiliate, you know? Yeah. So then you, you're you seeing this, you know, in the future. You see, okay, this is the affiliate thing. Google's kind of coming down on it. I need to do something different. What things did you explore at the time? Um, I explored a lot of things, like doing, like, um, selling e-books, doing lead generation for annuities. Like, I, I dabbled a lot of stuff, and I, I eventually... You know, realize, hey, why don't I start a business based on? Like, I had a lot of success promoting, you know, software as an affiliate. Let me start a software company based on the experience I had. Yeah. Figured, how hard can it be to actually get the software developed? <laughs> uh, was I seriously <laughs> famous wrong last about that words, right? <laughs> Yeah, famous last words. <laughs> I said, okay, let me develop my own software, and so I teamed up with uh, somebody who was actually a former coach for PPC Classroom. Is uh, same as Peter, so we worked together, and we um, we said, okay, let's let's get our own product developed. Yeah. So at this um, point, let me ask this because this is interesting. What was your vision at that time? What kind of what did you want the software to do? Um, just the vision at the time was just to get to a couple million dollars and and create a, a comfortable income, create a kick-ass software that people like, you know. I mean, did you say, I want the software to do this, or what, what were you thinking that the software would do at the time? It was a PC optimizer. So our initial goal was to just, rep, it was a commodity product. So our initial goal was just to create something similar to other products in the market. So for people who don't know, what what's a PC optimizer? So basically, it depends on what type of product. There's like, you know, companies like uh, PC Tools, Reimage. Uh, Uniblue, you got, you may have heard of. So basically, it helps you know address registry issues, optimize computer settings, speed settings, uh, you know, stop unwanted programs from popping up in your computer. So how hard was it to actually get it developed? Yeah, it was a freaking nightmare because we had never actually you know run a, I never actually run a development team. So. I ran into this slick talking uh, guy from uh, from California, from LA, and he painted this amazing picture for me how he's going to create an amazing software for me, and it's going to be number one in the market, this and that. And then he convinced me first to have, uh, hey, why don't you get this this smaller application done first? This uh, called Startup Boost, where I'll just basically remove unwanted programs that pop up on people's computer at startup. Mm -hmm. But okay, so he delivered on that. It cost about I don't know, like seven to ten k. And he had us at that point. He hooked us in, you know. Yeah. And he said, "Okay, well, we're going to work on your, you know, your PC optimizer, registry cleaner product." And uh, he started billing us twenty five thousand dollars a month. Wow! And said, "It's coming any day. It's almost done. Almost done." And then, uh, as eventually, I just ran out of money. I told him, "Hey, you're gonna have to stop because we're out of money." And uh, he had nothing to show for it. Wow. That's crazy. And so, and so we almost went bust. Like, cause it, and, and then later what happened is uh, I met a guy at an industry conference and I said, hey, you know, I've been working with this guy, um, spent 125 grand, didn't deliver, what's going on? Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he scammed seven other people in our industry. I had to sue him just to get him to finish our product. Wow. So, <laughs> so it's the like same scam. He'll deliver on something yeah. small and show you could do it and then bill you a huge amount and then not deliver. Yeah. It's like a professional confidence artist. Wow. Professional confidence artist. Like you've ever seen the shows, like, you know, you, the guy comes in with the suitcase. Hey, I'm going to triple your money in 30 days. And you know, this, I don't know if this is for you. I don't know if you're, you know, and they just kind of like, they kind of use all these psychological tactics to hook you in and, right. and, and build trust. And then when uh, the rubber meets the road, they're gone with your money. Yeah. And this, you know, the PC optimizer thing, I mean, it wasn't out of the blue. Like you had, it sounded like from what I read, you had sold a lot of this type of software in your affiliate days. As an affiliate, yeah. So you were pretty experienced. You're like, okay, I can move this if we yeah. create this. Yeah. There was a lot of people in like between 2005 and 2000, a lot of people promoting like PC optimizers, antivirus on Google AdWords, it was like an incredible opportunity. Yeah. It's like in insane because there's so many keywords that are relevant to these types of products and it was a mass market product. Yeah. A lot of volume opportunity. So this guy steals a bunch of your money. But what do you do? What do you do next? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a good legal contract so we could not 
sue him. Yeah. Mistake number one, you know, not having an ironclad legal contract. Because this is, here's the best way to protect yourself against a con artist. If you have a good attorney draft an ironclad legal contract, no con man is going to sign it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So even if it costs like $5,000 to get a good legal contract written, it, it, will, it could save you potentially $125,000. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. Looking back. So then how do you get this software produced then? So uh, we almost went bust. And um, my business heart partner had some contacts with uh, a guy he had a white label with. So with uh, a product that automatically updated out of date drivers. There's another utility product. It was a driver update program where it outdated out of date drivers on Windows computers. So we started promoting that. And got some traction with that enough to, you know, you know, keep the lights on, you know, take a small salary. And six months from there, we hired two more developers to develop our product. And these guys were actually based on a referral. This time we actually had an attorney write an ironclad legal contract based on milestones and fixed costs to get it done. Uh, that wasn't good enough, though. They got 90% of the way done, but the, the end product was a train wreck. I mean, the interface, uh, it was like chicken scratch. Every other button I clicked, the program would crash. Wow. It was horrible. And so what I had to do is I had to go on to Eli, out of desperation, like we're running out of money, remember? You know, running out of money because uh, the, the, the white label sales were going up and down. They were inconsistent. So some months were good, some months were bad. So it was, it was like a freaking panic attack every other month yeah. with sales. So these guys... Um, these guys were like, okay, uh, they're like, we're going to get it done for you. We're going to get it done for you. All the while, they're, they started working, they started logging in less and less hours to the point they're only working a couple hours a week for us. And so we had to wait weeks just to get a bug fixed and they couldn't fix the interface. I said, screw this. We need to get this done. We need to find, if the guys you have on your team are not getting it done, you need to replace them. Right. Especially in the development team, you know, you can't, you know, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So I went out, I went on to Elance. I actually did something really different on, on, if you want to find a good freelancer, what you do is you type in the exact issue and challenge that you have and say, I need something you can fix this. And then you take a look at all the responses you get back. And then based on the responses, you, you find the person that you feel you have the, has the most confidence and gives the most convincing answer right. as to how to solve the problem. So we did that. We found a guy called Mariusz. And he, within literally a week, he fixed our whole interface and made it look uh, spectacular. Mm. And this is, I think, 2011, like fall 2011. And then fast forward to 2012, I think it was about spring of 2012, application was done. However, there was one process. bug. <laughs> Great. Want another one? One bug that was a, a basically, a, basically a, a application conversion killer. The application was supposed to, you know, like you, you install the application and there's a pre check box, yes, uh, launch and, and run application. And then once you hit finish, it was supposed to launch the application immediately and start running the scan to find, you know, all the issues on people's computers. Yeah. It didn't do that. They just stop. <laughs> now this is like a, a, pre, a premium model, so a freemium model. So it was like we were paying for every single install on people's computers, mm. and so we wanted it. And and they actually ran the program, and then they'd go through the app, the program to purchase. So if the program didn't run, like the engagement like dropped by like eighty percent. So, so at what it was, point it was basically conversion killer and we're like, guys, you need to fix this. And yeah. I think six weeks passed and they they couldn't fix it. It was a, it was some obscure Windows, you know, very technical uh, uh, Windows user access uh, control issue. Mm. And so again, I said, hey, this needs this shit needs to get done. I went on to Elance. I posted about the issue. I had a guy who just pro bono just said, hey, here's how you fix it. Mm. You don't got you don't have to pay. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll help you further. Yeah. Guess what I did? <laughs> I hired him immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hired him immediately, got out of Italy, and within like 48 hours, he had the program running. He turned out to, those two guys, Marius and Roberto, turned out to be the dynamos, the head developers in our company. And uh, they ran our entire development team moving forward. 
those two guys I found at the very end when we're at uh, Dire Straits. I mean, be able to dynamos. I mean, I mean, at this point, it sounds like okay, just just pack it in, like forget this software thing. <laughs> yeah. Let yeah. me just go back to the affiliate thing where someone's already created the software, and I'm just going to market it. Because at this point, now you have it after all this work, and now you have to market it, right? So, so what happens next? So now you have it; they fixed it. It's running, and um, as you can expect, it didn't ex- it didn't blow up right from the, out of the bat. We, we had sales coming in; it just wasn't performing well. We had a little bit of profit. It just like what the hell? It's not working. And so we beat our heads to the wall for a couple months trying to figure out. Like we made like so much money as affiliates, we're like barely stripping by as a merchant. Like what's wrong with our application? Right. And uh, what we discovered, so we decided to do uh, a lean startup methodology, you know, get feedback from users and try to figure out what users are experiencing to figure out what what the problem was. So we used uh, an application called uh, usertesting.com, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. And we had 10 people actually go through the application uh, from point of downloading it to the point of actually going over the order page and, you know, answering specific questions about the user experience and giving a rating to the yeah. application. Yeah. And four out of 10 of the users could not finish the process. They ran into a bug <laughs> when they're running the scan. It wouldn't even finish the scan. Um, so bingo, that was, um, we, we found the issue. Sounds it, like a nightmare. And, and what's crazy is that we did standard QA on, you know, on clean, you know, virtual machines on a virtual, and we didn't find anything. These are issues that are happening on real computers. Right. And um, so what we started doing is we installed something called Matt Mantis bug tracking. So we uh, we started tracking every time a program crashed or something weird happened or froze and sent it back to our servers so we can start tracking what users were seeing. Mm-hmm. And we discovered there were scores of errors all over the place that we weren't seeing. Within a couple of weeks, our developers, Marty from Berkeley, were able to fix all of those issues, and our conversions barely botched. Hmm. So after fixing all these bugs, nothing happened. So we're like, okay, back to, then, back to the drawing board. Okay, what's going on here? We fix all these bugs. Why did the conversions go up? Right. So we went back to uh, user testing, and we had even friends and family take a look at it. And uh, I think somebody noticed, like, whoa, the scan, the, the scan's rolling super fast. And our competitor scans take like several minutes to run. Like, what's going on here? I'm like, well, that's how fast the scan actually runs. It's really fast. It doesn't take long to scan all these computer registry and stuff. Mm. And I'm like, oh my god! It, it. And then I think somebody commented, like, this sounds, this it looks fake. It's too fast. Mm. Like, oh my god! And so, and so my business partner suggested, hey, how about we slow down the scan and just like deliberately slow it down so it looks like. Looks more thorough. I mean, this is crazy, but you know, companies like Priceline and any sites where you're looking at like move, uh, <laughs> looking up like airline tickets and hotels, it takes like a millisecond to actually get the results. Right. But they make you wait like a couple seconds because it seems like it's doing something more significant. <laughs> <laughs> so we slowed down the scan. So instead of taking like five seconds, it took very nine. psychological. Yeah, it took two minutes. Our conversions doubled. Wow. Sales conversions doubled. That's amazing. And we finally were getting traction. Our company started to really take off at that point, to the point where we can start hiring people. And um, the other thing is, um, we actually also, you know, a big part of you know really growth hacking is finding opportunities to you know cross sell and upsell additional products. So we started uh, when after people purchased, we started recommending the driver application that was our white label, the user to our to our customers. And then we had 15% of them take that. Mm. And then we had started. We also uh, started uh, recommending that people call in for uh, a PC technical tech support, where they would uh, actually have a white glove service for somebody logging in their computer and fixing any issues they had. Mm. Uh, that's what got embroiled us with the uh, with the FTC, which I'll talk about later. Yeah, and, I have a uh, note to to talk about <laughs> that. Yeah. Took the whole company down. And uh, I'll talk about that in a second. I'm here. glad you could smile and laugh about it, but it's it's pretty painful stuff. It's know? it's very painful. I'll yeah. tell you what. Uh, yeah, I'm still uh, settling with them, even though uh, we nice. want support. It's uh, they uh, the government regulatory agencies uh, want to make your life very painful. 
So the white glove service. So now you have a. So, so how much was? Two, yeah, we, had, we had an upsell and we had a cross sell. Yeah. That doubled our order value. So instead of making like thirty five dollars per sale, we made seventy dollars per sale. Hmm. Which I'll, I explain in a second why that was so significant. Yeah. So we started making enough revenue. We started. You know, you get to the point where like, okay, you get a couple outsourcers and as a union, your business partner, your co-founder. I'm like, wow, we can actually start hiring people now. So I brought on, I brought in an executive team. I brought on, uh, on a contract basis, a uh, a lady who did fantastic HR for us. It was all on a contract basis. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a guy who helped us with uh, kind of like the the financial reporting and regulatory, like getting all the insurance and all the all the corporate type of stuff that you don't want to get embroiled with as a founder. Yeah. And uh, we had a great legal counsel as well. So that was kind of like my executive team that I got counsel for on the corporate side of things and how to structure a company, which is really important. Uh, you don't have to be an expert at that to be a founder. You just need a vision and a passion and, and be really good at, you know, growing your company. So having outside help was a big was a big deal on, on a contract basis. So you can kind of control the cost. You don't have to hire these folks full time because it would, you know, be like $200 salaries a person, you know? Right. So we did that and then we hired, uh, first thing we did, I think we hired a full-time um, web developer. Uh, uh, our, our developers were already full-time. Like I think our developers were like part-time, but we hired them, we pretty much brought them on full-time. So they were working like, I think our guy in Italy was working 80 hours a week. Wow, 80 hours a week, wow. Yeah, the guy's a machine, amazing guy. So, and uh, the guy in Poland, uh, full-time. So we had two full-time, developers, uh, one full-time web developer, and then we brought on a lady who did uh, like social media for us full-time. That was our that was our first initial team in, in early 2013. So like what was the web developer doing? Market. What's that? What was the web developer doing? Because it sounds like you have the software in place where there are constant bugs that need to be fixed or what? I, it's like when you, have a, when, you have a, when you have a company that's growing, there's constantly stuff that's coming up. He yep. was doing everything from adding on additional payment cards, uh, we're developing new products. Uh, there was a lot of uh, our application interface with our server quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of complexities that went on in the back end that we needed a full-time person for. Yeah. Tracking, payment processing, interfacing the application. We eventually developed a, uh, a platform for tracking, like every time somebody downloaded and installed the application and purchased it. So we had yeah. a whole interface to do tracking. So there was a, a lot of work that kind of ballooned as we kind of grew our company and reinvested our profits into, you know, yeah. de uh, development. Yeah. So, so you hired the team. Just to back up for a second. So what were the best ways you found? Obviously, you were at this point, you're getting customers. What were the best ways you found to get customers? Before, you know, before you could do the hiring and, and ramp all that up? Well, initially it was all Google AdWords. Mm. Like we were making all our money from Google AdWords and we kind of had experience in that. So it's really good, like when you're starting a company, if you have one, if you have one marketing channel that you're really good at, that you yeah. can kind of, you know, latch on to and kind of, you know, validate your business model, get your product market fit and get some revenue coming in the door. And so if you get really good at one channel, if you're doing B2B, maybe it's cold email, uh, if you have a startup application, maybe it's like uh, PR. A lot of people do SEO, blogging. For us, it was AdWords. Yeah, I was very good at AdWords. So yeah. that, that's how we found uh, our initial traction. And then from there, we went in a very different direction because we kind of made a breakthrough because uh, our our order value was seventy dollars. It was high enough that we can actually go to a lot of these ad agencies. Uh, ad networks and work directly with them. Like companies that did uh, specialize in doing banner ads mm. and uh, affiliate networks. And so we started recruiting affiliates to promote our product. Uh, we started working with companies out of Israel. There's quite a few companies that are very good at doing banner ads. So uh, we were able to drive our sales up very rapidly by working with these companies. Because mm -hmm. we thought like, hey, you know, you gotta understand what your core competency is as a company. Our core competency was creating a, a really awesome product and getting that product to convert really well. Right. Like from the landing page to when people download the product to when people buy. Mm -hmm. So we decided we're going to focus all our energy on that instead of learning how to do all the traffic generation on our own. So we outsourced the traffic generation. 
uh, the, the customer so support and tech support, all that stuff, we outsource that as well. But a call center that we had, uh, that we did, uh, that we had a relationship with that were a client of theirs. So, and then we had all these agencies we work with that drove us traffic. So we focused, so it's all about hyper, being hyper specialized in what you're best at. And that was, for us, it turned out to be developing a really awesome product and getting that product to convert. So for every person that installed the product, we're very good at, you know, converting them to a paid user. Yeah. So I mean, on the conversion front, it sounds like you did an amazing job ask getting a lot of user feedback and them so telling it's all about. you. <laughs> so besides the that that's an amazing one where you slowed it down and it took longer to run through the scan, what else worked for conversion that you found? I give you a couple other uh, there's a lot of things that we found. We actually ended up like five Xing our conversion rate five wow. at a time. That that's what got us to the hardest part about quickly scaling your company is actually improving your conversion rate. Because yes. once your conversion rate gets high enough, it's easy buying the traffic. Or you can even have a, an agency buy the traffic for you or outsource that. But you as the, the, the product owner, you need to get that, that conversion as high as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's really the biggest growth hack. So yeah. a couple of the things we found out. Um, we slowed the, the scan down. The other thing we did, we had uh, our, our trial version of our product uh, fixed um, issues in two areas for free. Hmm. And initially it would just fix them instantly and we just say, okay, we fix issues and fonts and file associations. It's like, hey, how about we slow that down too? So we uh, had an, uh, so we, we had like a little, we slowed it down, we instead of instantly it was 10 seconds and we showed like a little progress bar going across that, that dramatically improved our conversion rate. Hmm. Dramatically improved our conversion rate. Um, the other thing we did is we did retargeting through the application. Hmm. We did email follow-ups. We did, you know, the idea of touch points were, let me step back a little bit. So this idea that you have a range of customers. You have your hyper-responsive customer, and, the, and then you have the guy at the other end that needs a little convincing before he buys, you know? So the, the hyper-responsive guy will download your app, use it, love it, buys it right away. Right. Most people will not do that. Yeah. So most people need a little bit of lead nurturing, a little bit of follow up, a little bit of encouragement. So a lot of people do that through email. We tried email; it was a disaster. Like people were not responding. The, the click through rates were like abysmal, like one percent, and and we were getting complaints, even though people like these from customers. Right. Like we couldn't even send an email like, "Hey, here's uh, how to improve your computer performance for free." And we just like, it was like total all content, all value, mm. and people didn't like it. So like, okay, email isn't working, what do we do? And so we said, hey, you know, one way to get 100% deliverability is actually follow up with people through the application itself. So what we did is with our scheduled scans, we had a lightbox pop-up come. The same type of lightbox pop-up, if you, if you go to a blog, you have a, you know, sumo me and you get all these pop-ups coming up everywhere, you know? So it's the same idea, except we did it through our application. Yeah. It would scan, it would pop up, and there would be a lightbox pop-up, you know, featuring like, hey, a, a, a box shot of the, of, the, of the software, a few bullet points, uh, uh, and then a, a button that said purchase now, you know? Just highlighting the benefits, hey, like pointing out the pain point you have, you know, 250 uh, unresolved issues on your computer, a few bullet points of, of the benefits of the application. It can help speed up your computer and reduce errors, um, and a box shot, and then a call to action. And that dramatically, dramatically improved, probably, it probably doubled our sales. Wow. So just having that, uh, just having that the touch points and the following up was huge. Yeah. And so we didn't do retargeting, we didn't do email follow-ups, that was that was kind of like retargeting email follow-ups combined into one. Yeah, because it just you just got to find how to reach your customer most effectively. Because you know if you can just think about retargeting or following up with email for certain markets, that might not be the best. Like if you have a mobile app, sending them an email is probably not the best way to follow up with them. Right. You know, you just got to find the right platform for doing that. Yeah. So yeah, user testing conversion was huge. Then you talk about, okay, we'll let the traffic people do their traffic thing. Are there any particular companies or resources people should check out as far as the banner ads or traffic wise for their business? Uh, yeah, there's like a whole bunch of, uh, this is 
specifically for um, I should say uh, for B to for B to C. Mm -hmm. So obviously you can you can do Google AdWords is great. If the Google Ad, uh, contextual network is great uh, for doing banner ads. Um, there's companies in Israel. Uh, there's a company called Iron Source that does a lot of uh, display, and also uh, we have success with that uh, paper install traffic, which is kind of gone down a bit because there's a lot of players that were uh, a little too aggressive in that space. Mm. And uh, there's affiliate networks. I think we had a lot of success with a company called Never Blue Ads. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, for a fact, I think um, like Groupon, for example, did a lot of volume with them. And they're mm. spending internationally. So uh, Never Blue Ads is great for uh, affiliate traffic. Um, also, you can use platforms like uh, Actually, wouldn't recommend that anymore. But yeah, so there's lots of there's lots of uh, right. affiliate networks and ad networks and agencies out there, like yeah. Advertise.com, and they can you know Google like affiliate networks and find uh, yeah, whatever. Google affiliate networks and banner ad networks and advertising networks. There's lots of options out there. So you hire? Is there? Do you have to take a pause and? I, Sorry, my wife is trying, oh. <laughs> trying to give me my, my vitamins. So. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if you I, need to I, take them, show them. Honey. You can give me the pills. Show the. <laughs> take show, what? Show the iodine kelp. Oh, I think that in the morning. Oh, okay. Yes, we can. <laughs> um, I mix it with I, I put it in the spoon with the fish oil, so I mix it all together. Smart. Um, so basically, you have to find a scalable. Yeah. Like our initial strategy was Google AdWords, and we realized it was. It was a lot of effort to scale it to the kind of volume yeah. that we wanted to, and we wanted to focus on you know just focusing on the build conversions. Yeah. So we outsourced all that. So you got to figure out like your strategy for first getting your initial validation, your business model, product market fit, getting a little bit of traffic in the door, and the next phase is hey, how can we take what we have now and and blow it up yeah. and blow up those two phases of the growth hacking, you know. And so that, that takes a little bit of trial and error to find out. It's, it's, and there's no, there's, no, there's no one method for any given company. It, it, you you got to find, depending on what type of application you have and user base, it's going to be a different strategy. Yeah. And so after the, then you get into the hiring phase. So what was the next phase that you were looking at in the business? So, so when I was a business growing up, what we did was... Um, we built, and I see a lot of people, you know, paying a huge amount of money for developers in the U.S. And there's some really talented people in the U.S. If you can find them, because the, the market's really tight for developers. We took a different approach. Uh, we went to Poland. So our guy Mariusz in Poland, who was a rock star, we said, "Hey, let's uh, set up a subsidiary in Poland." It wasn't cheap. It cost fifty grand to set up a, a subsidiary between all the legal paperwork and accounting and all that stuff. Well. So we set up a subsidiary in Poland, we had a company there, we set up offices there, and we immediately started by hiring six developers, like right off the bat, and uh, we had an office going there. And so we had uh, Mariusz, um, it's really important when you set up an, uh, an offshore office like this that you have, these are all full-time employees, you have one guy who's a leader who can uh, take the bull by the horns and, and kind of run the operation there. Mm -hmm. So Mariusz, it turned out, we got lucky, turned out to be a rock star. Mm. Amazing at uh, amazing leader and manager. So he was able to, with that team of six people, rebuild our entire product from scratch using an entirely new platform within three months. Wow, bug free. Much different from your first experience. <laughs> yeah, much different from our first experience. When you get the right team in place, you got talented people in place. It's magic happens when your yeah. development team is right. Yeah, and eventually you took that development team. We hired QA people. We hired designers, all in-house, right in Poland. And, I mean, we probably we saved an ungodly amount of money yeah. just by going overseas with it. And the team was amazing. Yeah. They were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, at what point do you have to be at in the business? You know, obviously from the beginning, uh, when you're funding this and you're paying this developer who's not producing anything, at what point in the business... Uh, Revenue-wise, do you have do you decide? Okay, we need to bring all these people on full time. We need to set up a separate, you know, thing in Poland. Yeah, I'm taking my. Um, what do you, you see that? <laughs> There's like seven pills there. Yeah, I was actually supposed to take this at lunch, but it looks like I forgot. Hi, did you just take these out, or were they sitting there? No, they, I just took them out. Unless you took them on your own. I did. I took them on my own. Oh. 
I had lunch already. We don't want you ODing on uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> 10 minutes later, yeah. he just collapses. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't want to see that. No, I don't. I don't. Um, um, so at what point revenue-wise do you decide, okay, it makes sense for us to set up this whole, this is a big undertaking, whole other office, whole team. It was, it was actually when our, uh, in 2003 when our revenue started taking off and we realized we needed more resources for development. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so we said, hey, let's go ahead and set up the office in Poland and let's uh, start creating a product line. Let's start creating, a, an, a, let's revamp our entire product. Let's create the whole thing from scratch. Let's make it even better than it was before. Uh, let's create a speed product that will actually do a lot of additional functionality like uh, you know, improve, uh, you know, uh, just tweak user settings to improve speed on the computer mm-hmm. and stuff. So we wanted to, we wanted to create a brand and a product and a company that we could sell for like nine figures. Right. Was the end game, you know? Yeah. So what was next? What was the next big milestone after the development team? Um, We had some challenges, so we yeah. faced some challenges. So yeah. we hired a, uh, a, a <laughs> I didn't, just to tell you, I had no idea what it was doing in 2013. Hired a guy, he was an affiliate manager. Within six months, I, I promoted him to VP of sales. Uh, the guy wasn't producing at all. Turned out to be a train wreck. Um, and I talk about this in my book, and he was like really paranoid. Like, I, I, This is the poker player. Yeah, this is the, he was like a professional poker player. At one point, ranked seventy six, and uh, wow. in the world. And so I, I don't, I don't want to bash poker players, but I don't know if they're. I can imagine you can be a little paranoid because you're always trying to see who's trying to bluff you when you're playing a hand of poker. So um, he uh, didn't know what he was doing. We were actually his job was to go and find ad networks and agencies that we would. Like we would spend money with, you know, yeah. like this is not like a really sales job. It's like channel management, you know, like, right. Hey, we're going to you. We want to spend money with spending you. spending so real you dollars. Money. Yeah. So you can run our, like we want to pay you money so you can run uh, ads for our product and service. Right. And he couldn't convince people to do that. Wow. <laughs> Let me give you it's money. Like that, that doesn't sound like a hard sell. Let me give you money. <laughs> and so we had to end up canning him. And it was a very costly mistake because he was actually responsible for uh, tracking our, our, our daily uh, gross profits. And and we were paying him mm. like a percentage of the gross profits mm. to incentivize him to produce. Right. And he decided he was going to leave out a couple of traffic sources to make his uh, to make his numbers look better. Ah, I see. So, yeah. So that, at that point, we decided, hey, we got to get rid of this guy. So we, we fired him, and um, it was our, our first major fire in the company. And you know how employees get when you make that first major fire? They get, they're get they catatonic. You know, everyone's freaked out. Uh, his replacement was a rock star, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were able, when we fired him, we were losing $5,000 a day. Wow. And I worked with his replacement, a guy named Pete, and we turned the company around in three months. Back into profitability. <sighs> And it, was that partially due to because he wasn't reporting accurately? Like you weren't sure where things were at because of that? Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. We weren't sure of where the company was at and the real estate of the company is – like if your KPIs are off, like the, every company should be monitoring KPIs on, a, on literally a daily basis. Like we're, what, what's the state of your company? Because you, you just can't wait for your P&L to come you know, like six weeks later. The end of the following month, you got to monitor the state your company's at. What's what's basically what's your cash flow? What's like what numbers do you need to track to make sure that you're performing well? You know, right. and it varies depending on the company. And ours was uh, the daily gross profits mm-hmm. is what we looked at pretty closely. Um, so yeah, we were, it was, we were sending a false signal. So we basically thought the company was doing okay, and it wasn't. And so that was that really upset me. <laughs> It's an understatement. Yeah. I mean, that could be catastrophic. Discovering, you know, you're losing $5,000 a day. Uh, Talk about having a panic attack. Yeah. 
because you talk about this in the book too. Like we're literally talking panic attack. It's not like uh, you're just not figuratively making the statement, yeah. right? Yeah, two hundred thousand dollar payroll. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean, because I think you talk about waking up. What, what was going on at that time? You said you were waking up, but sometimes with the panic attacks. Yeah, yeah, because it was just like I was just, it was scary. It was scary because we had two hundred thousand dollar payroll. We had money in the bank, but we're running through it really quickly. Yeah. That's money we had saved for taxes, mind you. And so we had to burn through all that cash to make payroll. And um, we we finally what we ended up doing. What happened was ninety percent of our sales were coming from one source, from one network. They were making us like ten to fifteen thousand dollars a day in gross profits. Well. That went to zero in six months. Jeez. Something happened on their end that we could control. Boom. And our the sales guy that I had fired just had his head stuck up his ass and didn't do anything about it. Jeez. He just couldn't turn the, he couldn't get other additional channels going. So that's when, you know, myself and Pete took over. We fired the guy and we drilled the relationship with uh, Neverblue. We literally, like, we were so determined to make it work for them. We flew out there. Uh, we gave all their affiliate managers bonuses if they hit certain sales levels. Yeah. Uh, flew out there multiple times. Uh, we probably dropped 100 k in getting that account going. Wow. And, but it, within, like, four, uh, within three months, it started generating $100,000 a month profit. Wow. So it was worth the effort, and that's what kind of saved the company at the moment. And yeah. then, we, and then we got other channels going as well on top of that. Yeah. So we we started to really diversify outside of just having one. If you have one channel or one client that's generating ninety percent of your sales, I mean, I you're you're skating on thin ice. Right. You want to be banking every cent you have. You don't want to start taking money out of your company and buying homes or or anything like that because you're in a very fragile position. It may not look fragile when the money's pouring in. Yeah. But uh, that could disappear literally overnight. Yeah, which you also talk about in the book, too. Um, so, what was the next major either challenge or success? And this major success was getting you know just keep we kept growth hacking, improving the bill, kept adding on. We got another company doing very well for us. Kept adding that on, and but the challenge was decisions we made. A year ago, we're coming back to haunt us. Because hmm. when you have the bigger your company gets, the more delay there is on decision making. So, like when you have a ten million dollar company, a decision you make now will come back and bite you in the ass eighteen months from then. Hmm. So there's a delayed effect. So what happened in two thousand thirteen? We're rolling in money, and you're like, hey, my business partner decided, hey, let's take a bunch of money out of the company and buy homes. We started paying ourselves like massive distributions. We thought, hey, we made it. This gravy train is going to go on for years. Let's uh, let's enjoy a little, you know. We worked hard for all these years. Let's Sounds take some good. Money out. Yeah. And uh, so I, I bought a house. My business partner bought a house, and uh, we we just took uh, probably like a million dollars a piece out of the company yeah. that year. Uh, and so and and so what happened was, you know, obviously the sales plunged at the end of the year because we lost that one source. Yeah. And uh, they plunged uh, so badly uh, that we had to take all the savings that we had saved for taxes to make payroll and cover cover invoices, invoice payments. Wow. To the point, uh, come next April, we didn't have enough money to pay for taxes. Mm. Wow. So we had to borrow $600,000 from the bank. Wow. Personally guarantee it to, uh, to make our tax payments. So then, so what happened was, and then the bank was like, you know, you screwed up, you took too much money out of the company, you, you jeopardized, you basically like gutted your company. And so we're gonna make you pay this back in a 10 month uh, period. Jeez. So $60,000 a month. I'm surprised they even gave you the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm Actually. surprised they gave you the money too. <laughs> <laughs> so $60,000 a month. Um, um, also, um, our, we were running like at, like we had good months and then we had like some weird shit happen in 2014. Like we had a super affiliate who was doing 300 sales a day. He suddenly disappeared. He got banned by Google. Apparently he was doing some things that were violating Google's terms of service. 
Uh, we find out about it, and by the time we find out about it, we got banned by Google. We lost all those sales. Wow. Uh, and then uh, what else happened? Yeah, so uh, we hired an agency to handle our AdWords account. And this is all while we're, you know, we're, if we hadn't had to pay the six hundred, uh, the $60,000 a month and had these weird, weird shit happen, we would have been fine. It could be your partner calling because he's on, off the train. It's, it's, no. a, it's, uh, it's one of my clients. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, could have tell him I couldn't make it. Uh, so anyway, so, so we had $60,000 a month. So we're, we're barely like breaking even, paying the $60,000 a month to the bank. Uh, lost one of our major affiliates, so we took a little bit of a dip there, and hired this agency that told us, "Hey, we're going to handle your AdWords account, no problem. You're going to be in good shape." Uh, they wrecked our AdWords account and uh, uh, drove our spend up to thirty thousand dollars a day with no additional sales. Whoa! Luckily, I caught it right away. Jeez! And so basically, it was a hundred thousand dollar train wreck. Because I had to spend seventy grand to get the Google account back to profitability because I rebuild the whole thing from scratch. And the way you build like a Google account, like you have to lose money in the beginning to kind of get the good placements. And so, so we lost a hundred thousand dollars there. Lost a bunch of money because we lost his affiliate because he did some stupid shit and got banned by Google. Um, I don't even know if it was our account because he had like twenty different accounts. So I think he was doing something shady on some other account. And they banned all of his accounts. Wow. He was like promoting like toolbars on another account that was connected to our account. And so they pretty much shut him down. Jeez. So that happened. And, and on top of paying $60,000 a month. And then we're okay. So we, we had to, I think we had to borrow some money from one of our vendors. We borrowed some money. And then uh, we reformulated our strategy. We're like, okay, we need to go international. That's where the opportunity is. So we did a little pivot and we shifted our efforts to doing international. Uh, we had some other channels that were starting to improve. So we were on the upswing. And uh, that was around uh, October. And then November, we got sued by the Federal Trade Commission. At fuel of the fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's... Yeah, sued by the Federal Trade Commission. They they shut down our company. Literally came in, shut down our company. Had a court order, shut down our company. We, we had to turn off our order processor. Wow. We couldn't take a single. We couldn't even process orders. They could do whatever they want at this yeah, point. They have like pretty much police state power. They can do whatever they want. And uh, they came in. They shut down our company. They said uh, uh, they hired some expert who said our software was bogus like this is a software we'd spend five hundred thousand dollars sweat blood and tears producing right. they said it was just making up stuff like it wasn't real and we're like this is ridiculous this is completely false so we had and then on top of that we had 10 days to fight them in court to uh overturn this uh injunction against our company so literally i got a legal team together of like 10 people like literally working around the clock and this the invoice turned out to be like 200 grand. Jeez. A 10 day period. Basically, we hired a, an expert who wrote 17 books on Windows to prove our, our product was real. Uh, our legal team, we made an amazing case. We got all the cu customer testimonies together, um, all types of information, facts, figures, information to, to show in the court. And our, our expert witness was doing a full analysis of the program, showing, hey, it worked. And the, the claims that the, the FTC made in their pinhead expert witness made were false. Let me turn off my phone here, give me a second. And so we, we went in court, it was amazing. It was like, and you know, my attorney said, hey, you know, this real court cases aren't like Matlock or these TV shows, they're actually really boring. It was not boring. Why? <laughs> it was crazy. Because the way it was set up, it was no, it, it wasn't, it, it was just basically a judge because just a preliminary injunction trial. It was basically a judge and no jury. And they skipped all the, the testimonies and everything. It was all written. All the deposition and the, and the, and the testimonies were all written. So we went right, it went right to cross-examination. So the whole case, the entire day, was all cross-examination. Wow. And it was like a movie. It was like something out of a movie. It was incredible. Yeah, tell me about it. What, what Probably it... Like one of the most you know, amazing experiences in my life. Scariest, but amazing experiences in my life. Um, so at one point, there was a funny scene where... Um, the FTC attorney comes up to me and says, hey, you know, um, 
It's like, so you went down to see this call, like the whole case was surrounded around the practices that the call center that, you know, we were working with this call center, one of like 20 clients. They're all, it was all focused on this call center on, in our software as well. Our software, we pretty much basically demolished their case. We proved that our software was real and that their, their expert witness was full of shit. Our expert, their expert witness had to actually recant during cross-examination, my attorney tore him apart, had to recant and admit our software was real. Yeah. And so it was It was pretty amazing. And uh, wow. there was some high fives going around <laughs> after that. And so anyway, so it was a funny scene where the FTC attorney, uh, I'm, I'm on, um, he's cross-examining You're on me. the stand. I'm on the stand. Yeah. And he's like, have you been down to, you've been down to the call center, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like, I've been down to the call center. Did you, did you go to like one of the call center owners? Did you go to this guy's office and, and see what he had in his wall? I'm like, what do you mean? He had pictures of of uh, Scarface and all these mob movies and, and Godfather up there. So you're telling me you thought these guys were legit when they had pictures of mob movies on their wall? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they're saying like, so basically, if you like mob movies, you're some kind of criminal or something. I'm like, what the hell? That was their defense. And so you say, what do you say to that? I didn't say that. I'm like, I just said, hey, just because he likes mob movies doesn't make him a criminal, you know? That's nuts. <laughs> so it was, it was just crazy. And so, like, when when they're attack against our software basically fell apart they started coming up with new stuff like oh well we don't like the fact your 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 registry you're checking this registry entry we don't think that's that useful compared to these other ones that you're scanning for and they're like really like technical like bizarre stuff like they just kind of came up with that grasping at straws at this point they're just grasping at straws so so basically we, we we won that it was a slam dunk we won the preliminary injunction but the thing is that that's just a preliminary injunction. That's just to overturn getting our company shut down. So we've got our company turned back on. And then there's another trial that's supposed to go on, where the real trial, which costs like millions of dollars. Now, remember, we were in a fragile financial situation at the moment. Right. Uh, getting our company shut down for three weeks basically completely wrecked our company. So we were like, like, like our, we had our nose above the water, you know, <laughs> just like staying afloat barely. Right. And we're like on the upswing and then we got sued and then shut down our company for three weeks. Huge legal expenses, so couldn't pay our bills. So none of our vendors, our advertisers would turn us off. Like, dude, you owe us like hundreds of thousands of dollars, pay up or we're never gonna work with you again. And we're like, right. dude, we're on the money. We just got our, we just got food barred by the government. You know? <laughs> So we couldn't turn any of our traffic on, and I had to lay off our entire staff. Jeez. Like, first week of December. Like, developers, everyone? Everyone. Wow. It sucked. I had to lay off everyone, including myself. Including myself. And then, uh, because we had a company in Poland, they have, uh, they have like eight weeks of severance or six weeks of severance. So I had to pay 80 grand to, uh, to pay the severance in Poland. Otherwise, Mariusz, our director there, would have been personally liable for that. And wow. that would have wiped him out. Holy cow. So. Jeez. What a tough decision. So we won, but we actually lost. And now I'm, I'm trying to settle with the FTC because I don't want to spend a million dollars fighting them in court. I'd like to have a million dollars right now. And so because I'm settling with them, I have to agree to uh, these ridiculous uh, restrictions on what I can do. I can never promote a PC optimizer again in any way or form. So at the, at you the, know, so, so there's no repercussions, Amit, for the government for doing that, for falsely accusing a business and shutting them, essentially shutting their business down for a period of time, which puts them out of business? What people don't realize is federal agencies have Gestapo powers. Yeah. They can go in and do crazy shit and wreck your business um, in a snap of a finger, and you have literally no recourse. Hmm. Like, all you can do is beg for mercy. Jeez. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's like something out of the medieval period, you know? I mean, it's crazy. It is, that's crazy. And, and you, know, you, you know, usually, like, people historically thought the FTC, like, usually they go after people, the type of people that wake up every day and think about how they're, they're trying to cheat their customers, you know? Right. Now they're going after companies over technicalities. 
a company is like, we had no intention of cheating anybody. We're trying to do the right thing. We're actually, we're trying to, like one of the things that we always focus on compliance and proving the compliance of our build and, and cause that was a big thing in our industry. And so we were actually striving to produce better and better products and provide more value yeah. and we still got nailed. I'm so just, now I'm like super vigilant about everything I do because yeah. like if you have a testimony in your website and if it's not properly disclosed about what type of connection you have with them, then you could literally be shut down to the FTC. They can freeze your bank account. They can shut down your business and they can wreck your entire life in the yeah. snap of a finger because yeah. you didn't follow their a ridiculously uh, a complex rules for uh, for you know for advertising and, and what have you. I'm just, I'm smiling because I'm like, who around the boardroom table is like, let's go after this PC optimizer company. Like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a sexy business we should like take down. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So you know, on the flip side of things, what, what was the proudest moment of the company? I mean, a lot of challenges, a lot of hard times, a lot of low points that you had to deal with because of all these factors. But what was one of the proudest moments? I had? think it was in 2013 when we, when we actually were, were growing and we, had a, we actually brought the whole team together to the first team meeting. And uh, my business partner and I, we sat down and we told stories about like, all the stuff we went through to build a company and yeah. we created this amazing vision. We all met at my, uh, my place in the city and that was probably my proudest moment, like yeah. when we actually had finally made it. We'd gotten to the point where we had this amazing team, we'd created great things, and we had a great future ahead of us. Yeah. And that was probably my proudest moment. So oh, there's other things that happened too. Uh, yeah. In 2014, that made things 10 times harder. Not only was I dealing with all this bad stuff happening in 2014, my business partner completely checked out that year. Like he took the entire month, he decided like when the company was losing $5,000 a day, he was gonna go adopt a child. Wow and disappear for a month. And I'm like, dude, like we're losing $5,000 a day, I kind of need your help, and boom, he was gone. He kind of checked out of the company, and uh, I had to basically run the whole company on myself. That's why I was under tremendous stress in 2014. Yeah, that's to put it lightly. What I, think you... I think he just cracked under the pressure, because yeah. it was a lot of pressure. Yeah. You know, like you were saying, like writing that bar to deck. I mean, yeah. there was a lot of pressure, so. What made you write the book? Most people are like, hey, I'm done with this. I don't want to think about it. I want to talk about it. And then you detail a lot of these challenges and really low points, hard times that most people don't even want to talk about in your book, you know, from zero to 12 million to bust. What made you decide to write the book? I think, I, it, I think my story was important enough. I had to share it. I mean, it is important, but, but important enough it still means you have to put these low points and challenges and hard times and think about them and then actually put them on paper. Well, I think that process was actually kind of healing, you know? It just, was. Just getting out in paper and yeah. it kind of helped me put it behind me. Jeez. I mean, and, and also it was an educational experience for me. I, I wanted to learn everything I could from the experiences I had. Yeah. Because it was, it was a decamillion-dollar learning experience. <laughs> It was uh, an education in the school of hard knocks. Seriously. You know, I have one last question. I want you to talk about what you're working on now. But before I do, just tell people, let's point people, where can they find out more? Where should they um, check out the book and, and any other places? Yeah, if you want to grab a free copy of the book, you go to ProfitSwami.com. That's ProfitSwami.com. And you can grab a free copy. Um, or you can go to Amazon and, and, and type in, you know, from zero to 12 million to bust and you can buy a copy. I think it's 997. Yeah. And then what you're working on now? I'm working on a couple things. I'm working with, uh, you know, I'm taking on a couple of uh, selected uh, clients I'm working with and uh, who, who want to who want help, you know, gr growing and scaling the company based on, you know, my experience of everything I've done. Yeah. And I'm also uh, launching a workshop called uh, the 10 X growth hacker workshop here in Boston. And I'm working with a guy named Dimitri from a blog called Criminally Prolific. Mm -hmm. And so we're teaming up. He's a wizard at PR and SEO, and I'm good at paid search. So, and we're bringing on two other guys who are good at uh, uh, t to also teach at the workshop. And one guy is a wizard at B2B lead generation. The other guy is a master at email. So we've got a lot of different mm. angles and strategies covered. Yeah. 
And so uh, it's going to be it's going to be very different than any other workshop that's been done in the uh, in the startup world in the sense that we're going to limit participation to only 30 people and we're going to give a lot of one on one uh, we're going to go through everyone's business mm -hmm. on, a, on pretty much like everyone goes up presents their business and we're going to tear it apart and kind of create a blueprint for them mm -hmm. And then even follow up with them to help them make sure they execute the blueprint, the growth strategy, of uh, the 10x growth hacker blueprint that we're going to build for them and then execute that and help them grow their company, you know? And this yeah. is, we're not going to take any equity from anyone or anything, but it's just going to be a high level personalized attention. And this is for the companies that, you know, can't afford to hire a growth hacking consulting and pay tens of thousands of dollars, right. but want that level of attention and personalization to, to help their specific company you know, build a growth strategy that's going to help them grow. Yeah. So basically, these people come, you'll have, a, you'll have a, a panel, a team of experts, basically giving people all the strategies and the blueprint in that yeah. portion of their company so that they kind of get a whole yeah. full circle view to, to build their company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to look at their business, each, everyone's business. And what's going to be kind of cool is that like the, everyone in the audience is going to see as we develop strategies for one, one business after another. Yeah. So you can be sitting in the audience and you, like maybe we haven't talked about your business yet, but you'll see how, you know, uh, the other guy's business, how we built a strategy for him. And you're going to learn the whole process of growth hacking in a very deep way. Mm -hmm. So people can check that out at 10 X growth hacker. Yeah. 10 X growth hacker.com. Dot com. Got it. You know, I mean, I really appreciate you being so open and sure. It's rare that someone is so open about everything in their business and from the ups to the, to the downs. And it's, it's really super valuable to hear about this so that, you know, people can learn uh, of what things they should be doing or not doing. Yeah. Um, what should we leave people with to end? If you were to, to, you know, we talked about a lot of different things, challenges, ups and downs, what, um, what message should we leave them with? Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if anyone in the audience has ever read the book, uh, 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 Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill. They talk about the, uh, the process of, um, of, of facing failure. Hmm. Failure is really not fail. I don't consider it failure. I consider it a stepping stone to success because a lot of the, the greatest tycoons and, and, successful people in history that Napoleon Hill associated with, like Andrew Carnegie and stuff like that, all of them at one point or another face like tremendous failure in their life. And, um, and that was a big key for their success because what mm -hmm. failure does is it breaks down all those habits, the failure habits that you might have had and allows you to reformulate new habits, new success habits to, to help you, you know, go to the next level. Because sometimes you got to face failures to kind of break those those patterns that you're in that are that are causing the failures to begin with. You know, mm -hmm. got to kind of hit hit those uh, hit those brick walls before you can bust through them. Right, right. And so I think that's it's a very it's it's Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill. So I highly recommend everyone yeah. read that book. Yeah, it's very powerful. So it talks the power of you know of what I talked about faith about you know after my company after my business went uh, my affiliate business went to zero I kept going and. Didn't go back to a job. Talks about the power of faith, power of uh, you know overcoming failures, and uh, power of persistence, positive mental attitude. Yeah, Amit, thank you so much. Everyone should check out ProfitSwami.com and 10xGrowthHacker.com. It's been an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Amit. Thanks. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand